This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. On the next Discover the Upper Cumberland, we take a look at the Joan Derryberry Commemorative Exhibition at Tennessee Tech. Next, we meet the owners of D&D Farm in Liberty, Tennessee, and then we visit ceramics artist Merrily Hall's studio. All of this and more on the next Discover the Upper Cumberland, right here on WCTE, your Upper Cumberland PBS. Funding for this program is provided in part by the United States Department of Agriculture. Welcome to Discover the Upper Cumberland, the series, where we explore our region of Tennessee. I'm your guide, Desiree Duncan. The Joan Derberry Commemorative Exhibition is another piece of Tennessee Tech's centennial celebration. Producer Daniel Duarte was in attendance during the opening reception, where Dr. Walter Derberry gave more insight on his mother's work. The show will be on display at the Joan Derberry Gallery inside the University Center at Tech until February 25th. The very first thing she would always do in the morning was to have her tea. She, being British, she had to have tea every morning. She'd have a whole cup of tea, looking out the window at the sunrise and such. And then she would um, go to her studio and start painting. And she would then, since she got up before sunrise, she had quite a little while to, to paint because my father was a late sleeper. And so she would paint until she heard him get up and then she would go and be through with painting for the day. When I was growing up, mother was a pianist. She did not start painting again until I left to go to the military. She had, when she was in school, she had been equally gifted in music and art, piano and art. And they told her when she was 15 that she was gonna to have to concentrate on one or the other because she was too good at each to do both justice. So at that point, from the age of 15, she played the piano, became a concert pianist, and then when we moved to Cookful, she did a little bit of, of painting, not painting really, art, pencil drawings. Um, and then when I left to the, go to the service in 1960, she started taking art lessons having to do with learning to, to um, paint oils, because she had never done that before. So from there, things just went crazy and she painted every day for the rest, most of the rest of her life. I'm Kimberly Winkle, I'm the interim director at the Appalachian Center for Craft and the gallery coordinator here at the Joan Derryberry Art Gallery. And today we're here to celebrate a special commemorative exhibition uh, highlighting the works of the First Lady, Mrs. Joan Derryberry. It's a very special exhibition for us, not only to have the opportunity to celebrate her works, but also to celebrate her huge impact that she had on the arts here at the university and also within the community. The way that this exhibition came together is through a conversation with Dr. Derryberry, Walter Derryberry and myself. We walked through his house looking at all of the wonderful paintings that she had created and he and I together discussed and curated the works to include in the exhibition. And what we were striving to do was to create an exhibition that displayed a comprehensive display of her artistic mastery, primarily focusing on landscapes and seascapes. So what you'll see in the exhibition is a nice variety, stylistic variations of these two subject matters presented. She started out very representational. And then as time changed, she became looser and freer in her style and in her choice of brushes because she originally used little fine brushes but then she got to where she'd use brushes this wide. My name is Laura Clemens. I'm the Centennial Coordinator for Tennessee Tech. We've, we're in the midst of our centennial celebration right now and I'm, we've had a very full calendar um, over the life of this centennial over a year now and one of the most important aspects of that has been art. We've focused a lot on art and on music for that matter. 
the end of all this, I think that one of my favorite um, aspects of the centennial celebration has been this exhibition of Joan Derryberry's um, paintings. I, I don't know that people remember um, how much of an influence she has had on, of course, the campus, but also the entire state. And, and this, this, uh, this exhibition of her, her work is gonna remind a lot of people of uh, how important she was to Tennessee Tech. I'm here with Dwight Henry, a Cookville City Council member. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ditcher. Thanks for having me so much. Yeah. Uh, we're here to talk about the Cookville Envision Plan for the future. Uh, give everyone kind of an explanation of what this is. Well, Envision Cookville is, is, is the City Council's way of turning to the community and helping us answer some real important questions at this time in, in the history of our city. Uh, you know, where are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we want to get there? And we, we, we believe and know that a lot of citizen input is very important because basically what are what we are and become as a community is going to be really up to us. And we've had some events that are very exciting. We had uh, a group of people in City Hall a couple of weeks ago and spent, uh, spent a, a good part of the day going to five different groups and, and, and facilitators and prioritizing uh, things. And then we had a lot of people participate online. So we've got a good idea about what people are thinking. Now it's just a matter of assembling those, prioritizing those, and implementing it, and probably having Desiree some ongoing uh, citizens work groups to help us advise, advise this. The last time we went through this, it was very productive for our city, and mm -hmm. we're really excited about this process this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited as well. I was able to be there that day just to kind of uh, basically get input from everyone else. I, I was just curious to see what are some of the other issues that folks have or things that they want to change or improve on. Sure. Um, so what were some of the top things that were of, seemed to be of huge priority to community members? Well, as I said, the, the, everybody, when it was City Hall participated in five groups, they moved from facilitator to facilitator and, and talked about such things as infrastructure, community facilities, quality of life, natural and cultural history historic preservation. And what we saw was, and, uh, and we've got the online results back already, but people were talking a lot about, for example, um, uh, recreational things. Uh, we, had a, we had a lot of folks interested in, in, in skate parks. Of course, naturally, we hear a lot about traffic flow and traffic movement. We hear a lot about this, right? You know, once folks get downtown, get to the west side, it's really beautiful. I mean, it's really, it's, it's vintage Cookville, it's Cream City, it's all of that. It's, it's, it's cityscape. But we can do a better job. At, we're getting really good at getting people to come to Cookville and have a good experience. TSSAA, the Harley Davidson folks, the all various tournaments. But when they get off of the interstate, the initial picture that they get is not good. So we want to do what Cityscape has done on the west side and give them some shock and awe, something something really nice and attractive as a gateway to the city. So that that issue had a, had a lot of response and a lot of interest in that. Of course, folks are interested in enhancing parks, enhancing family entertainment, uh, you know, uh, sidewalks is always an issue. Just those, all these kind of things that we can do and become. We're, we're at a very a crossroads. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're moving up a notch. as a, We used to be maybe one of the best kept secrets in Tennessee. Now more and more people are learning about us, and we're glad, mm -hmm. but we, we, have, we have some responsibilities that come with that. And Envision Cook, what we believe, is going to help us uh, move in that direction. And I know in some of the groups that I uh, was in, there was a lot of talk of um, curbside recycling. Yes. You know, bringing that in, uh, as well as bike lanes. You yes. Know, I, I try to commute to work whenever I can, but it's sometimes it's still a little unsafe. Uh, other motorists aren't exactly educated about uh, sharing the road with bicyclists. <laughs> uh, but there's just so many great ideas sure. that are possible. Um, so what what are the next steps? The next step is... Uh, we, as, as we, we prioritize, we had a number of people in City Hall, about 100 folks. We had about 100 folks participate online. And then we prioritize all those recommendations and suggestions and thoughts. And then we determine what the top 8 or 10 or 12 are that the people have on their mind. And we feel like the needs and the desires of the people. And then we begin to say, how do we address these? Mm -hmm. Some of these things, Desiree, are going to be things that are ideas that that they don't cost anything. Just no one had voiced it before and thought of it before. Those would be fairly easy to implement. And then we begin to say those like like uh, like, like like sidewalks and bike trails and all that. What uh, do we need an ongoing citizen uh, citizens advisory group to help us implement this thing? So I think you'll see some of that coming out it, after the prioritization. Then this council will begin to say. 
which ones realistically can we move on? Because this, these are things that are on the minds of our citizens. That's what they're thinking about. That's what they need. That's what they want. So how can we have citizen input in terms of helping us implement these things? And I think you'll see that as sort of phase two. The launch, the way I described it was, is, is when we gathered at City Hall, that was, uh, I said to the folks at the end of it, it's like trying to get a, a drink of water out of a fire hose. I mean, a lot <laughs> came at them in one day. But that was just getting the, the aircraft on the runway. That was just getting it moving around the room and getting it launched. Now that we've got it launched, we've got these things prioritized, then we move into implementation. This is not going to be just a plan that sits on the shelf. This is Envision Cookville. This is what our citizens have said. This is where we want to go. This is what we want to be. This is what we want to have. So this council is really committed toward moving toward those things. All right. Well, we're looking forward to what you and your team are going to uh, do for the city. And just want to thank you again for joining us. Desiree, thank you so much. And thank you for all that WCTE does in this region. Thank you. And we'll be back with more Discover the Upper Cumberland. Thomas and Heather Theriak started D&D Farm when they moved to Liberty, Tennessee from Florida. With their three children in tow, they made the move in order to grow their own food, live a better life, and to show their children where their food came from on their spring-fed 10-acre farm. WCTE's Jacob Carr takes us to this year-round farm. So D&D Farm comes from my three children's name, um, Dalton, Nathaniel, and Danielle. Um, if you ask the other two, it could be Danielle, Nathaniel, and Dalton. Um, it depends, you know, who you ask. We f formerly lived in Tampa, Florida. I was in the entertainment business. And just from over time of traveling, and we were ready to make a move. We scouted out Tennessee is where we wanted to go. And uh, my wife came up and did a three-week trip on uh, looking for homes and properties for us. And we found this property here in Liberty, Tennessee. When we moved here, it was to raise it, eat it, and grow it to provide food for my family um, off the land. I hope one day that the kids realize what we did for them, moving them from the big city to know um, where their food comes from and how to grow it and to raise it on their own. And uh, I hope they take that with them. We're all natural. I don't put any chemicals on any of the produce that I grow. I'd much rather rip it up and start over than put a chemical on it. Because it's going, my family's eating it and that's the whole point of it, to raise it and grow it is to know where the food comes from. So. So I don't put any chemicals on the, any of my plants or produce. I also sell to restaurants, and we sell to a market up in the Sparta area. So we're, we're, this property is almost 10 acres, and we're fortunate to be surrounded by thousands of acres. So our meat source we get here on the property with deer. When deer season comes up in turkey season, we, um, we hunt the turkey and the and the deer on the property. And we also raise our chickens. Um, so most of it, we try to raise it and grow it ourselves. But if we don't, we have, you know, one friend raises beef. So we get our beef from there. And then um, another friend does raise turkey. So sometimes we'll get our turkeys from him if, if we don't have any luck hunting um, on the property. But we've been fortunate um, on the property and also with our friends that also hunt that um, help us to fill our freezer for the winter. So I would recommend that um, everybody grows something. Um, you can, you know, you don't have to do gardening on, on this side of a scale. You can do you know, you can garden in a raised box, you can garden in cement blocks and, and start there. And it's an amazing thing to walk out on your porch or in your yard 
and pick a tomato or a squash and then, you know, cook it and, and, and eat it. You know, that's, there's something to say about that. Um, and it's a great feeling. Um, you know, it's the kids, you know, it was the same thing for the kids raising the chickens. You know, when we got those, I told them to don't, don't name the chickens because sooner or later they're going to be on your plate. Um, so now they know, you know, and they name all the chickens dinner. So um, they know as well, you know, where their food comes from and, and getting up in the morning and doing chores before they eat, um, before they, you know, eat breakfast. To, um, there's things they need to do before that. I'm here with Dr. Michael Birdwell, who has a new book out. Yes, uh, I do. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of your, your work on the people of the Upper Cumberland. Okay, this is the, the new book, People of the Upper Cumberland, Achievement and Contradictions. Um, this project started five years ago. Uh, Calvin Dickinson and I wrote a, a book before this one called Rural Life and Culture of the Upper Cumberland, which is the worst title ever, but it's a great book. <laughs> And so when reviews came out about the book, people were review, re reviewing the book we didn't write. Well, it's, so it's amazing how, how critics are, and, and they're just like, well, this isn't in there, we're my people. So you're getting ready for the trilogy. Well, I've got two other book contracts I gotta fulfill first, but okay. yes, yes, we are, one, one suggestion has been that we do a book on industries in the Upper Cumberland, you know, like Colonel Sanders started in Corbin, Kentucky, which is in the Upper Cumberland. Mm -hmm. Stearns Coal and Lumber Company, which of course now is Big South Fork, National River and Recreation Area. That's hard to say. And so that may be, but Randy Williams, who has an article in this about Native Americans, and it's quite good. Randy Williams' suggestion is that we do something about crime in the Upper Cumberland. Ooh. Now see, that will sell money. Yeah. You know, and, and, and there's all kinds of notorious folks. Mm -hmm. So that's a possibility. But, but we, we're always looking for stories. Cool. And, and it's not hard. But this, this, has, this has medicine. There are three articles about medicine. There are three articles about African Americans. Mary Alice McClellan is the very last photograph in the book. <laughs> and we have an article about John's Place. I have an article about uh, J. Robert Bradley, who was an opera singer who was taught here at Tennessee Tech before integration. And so then there, I've got an article about moonshining. There's an article about, uh, Troy Smith has an article about Champ Ferguson, um, Mike Allen on the, the Cumberland River. There's just a host of different stories in here. So what a great idea with this book, not necessarily being something that you and Dr. Dickinson just kind of hammered out. This was a, a group collaborative. Mm -hmm. Uh, effort. You had journalists, you had historians, lawyers, uh, storytellers um, telling to the story of the Upper Cumberland. Correct. And yeah, and, and the next one, we will have a, a, a very group as well. And, and the idea is that, I mean, I love that folks come to us and say, hey, have you thought about writing about this? Have you thought about this? And there's a story in the cover. I mean, the, the cover, we didn't choose the cover. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we gave UT images to illustrate the book, and I'm glad that they chose this picture mm -hmm. for the cover. This photograph was taken by Albert Gannier in 1941. Albert Gannier was a, an ornithologist in Nashville. We have Radnor Lake because of Albert Gannier. Oh. And so Gannier goes to Pall Mall to shoot 67 photographs that were used to make the costumes in the set of, of, of Sergeant York. So it's just, you know, that's just a wonderful photograph. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So what, just, you know, a, a short summary of what is your favorite part of this book or what just sticks out to you as just a quintessential story of the Upper Cumberland? i tell you, uh, Laura Clemens' story about J. Robert Bradley, it made me cry yeah. when I read it. It's just really, really good. And Mike Allen's story about the Cumberland River and, mm -hmm. and taking it from prehistory to the present is, and he writes beautifully. Uh, I mean, those two are two of my favorites. Uh, of course, the ones I wrote, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, with this anthology. All right, so where can folks get uh, this wonderful book? Well, the book, you can get it through Amazon, but the best thing is to contact either me or, or Dr. Dickinson because we can get it for you at the, at the author's discount price. Okay. So instead of paying $57 a book, we can sell it for 40 Oh, awesome. Are you sure you want to get bombarded with uh, emails and calls? Look, we want to sell books. <laughs> okay. And the thing is, once once the press reaches a price point, 
know, the book price will come down. So that's in everybody's best interest. Okay, to, to contact you. Yes. All right, and we'll put that information up for you. Uh, anything else you'd like to give us about uh, about your, your project or what you have coming up? Well, we ha I have uh, three things coming up. Okay. On November the 7th, 6th and 7th, the Tennessee Great War Commission, of which I am the chair, is having our first symposium about the, the Great War. It's in Nashville from 9 to 4.30 on the Bicentennial Mall and State Museum and, and the state, uh, the, the military branch. So we mm -hmm. want folks to come out for that. Okay. Then I've, I'm working on a book on Tennessee and World War One, and then working on getting ready to gear up for the next Upper Cumberland <laughs> book and finishing a moon, book on moonshine. And there is a teaser in this book Okay. about the moonshine book. So there's well, a chapter on moonshine that's like, wait for the full story. <laughs> okay. Well, we do love our moonshine in this uh, part of the country. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Birdwell, for joining us. Thank and you, Desiree. We'll get back with more Discover the Upper Cumberland. Throughout ceramics artist Marilee Hall's career, she has made work that tended toward the whimsical, vessels and sculpture forms with a lift. The work has felt spirited to her, almost inhabited. In this 30th year in clay, her work is becoming more story-driven. Sometimes it feels illustrative of folk tales, sometimes a compassionate look at the human psyche. Producer Daniel Duarte takes us inside Marilee Hall's studio. I love the throwing out of a slab. The the rhythm of it is just amazingly wonderful. Um, so, you know what, I think I experience it lots in a rhythmic way. I began as a potter making bowls and casseroles and things that one can use for eating and so forth. And I began to want to express myself more. Uh, it became more fun. I became more confident in my craft and began to add appendages, colors, graphics, many things to help me describe what I was feeling. I gradually switched from utilitarian work to uh, expressive work that I would say perhaps is narrative. There is a story that is, uh, it becomes clear as you look at the pieces. I like to work with people, with animals. I have no problem combining them, a bird with a person body or vice versa, um, a cat with a bird head, um, anything, uh, anything goes. Uh, could describe my work possibly as magical realism. It, the creative process is so funny because um, I, I sketch, I draw, I look through old drawings, I, I leaf through magazines, and I'm just looking for a portal into the process. It's very exciting, scary, uh, challenging, and um, I spend lots and lots of time preparing all the pieces out of wet clay. and. Then the pieces are bisque fired. And then comes the second stage when I paint the pieces. I, paint, I will paint some graphics on some pieces and lots of times I have created a scene and I will paint the people the color I think they should be or the animals. They just kind of come to life. I, when I, especially when I paint the eyes, lots and lots of uh, entities are in there uh, on the pieces that I make. There are things with spirits and so, um, you know, like in any person or being with the spirit, they've got eyes, and that's where you look. They're the windows to the soul, as we know. I do love painting them. So it's a mixture of slab rolling and hand building. Many other pieces are totally hand built, and, uh, but most I'd say have a, some combination of 
boiling, slab rolling, hand building. Today I was thinking about my work and I thought, you know, I would, would not mind if people thought that this work reminded them of a poem because uh, it can be, can be looked at, it can be enjoyed, it can be digested, and, um, and it doesn't take that long. The, the thing that I want to say with my work and with my life is be compassionate. Express yourself. Um, let's be open together. Let's drop judgment. Let's, let's hug. Let's laugh. Let's read poems. Um, let's just be together. We'd love to see the Upper Cumberland through your eyes. So tag us in your pics on social media with the hashtag DiscoveredUC, and you just might see your shot on our next episode. For more info on this show and to catch your favorite segments, visit our website, wcte.org discover. Also, if you have any topic ideas, email them to discover at wcte.org. Thanks for joining us, and remember to get out there and discover the Upper Cumberland. Funding for this program is provided in part by the United States Department of Agriculture. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.